Hello and welcome to the European Resilience Initiative Center video podcast. Today our guest is Malcolm Nance, who is a U.S. Navy Senior Chief Petty Officer, retired, specializing in naval cryptology. He's also an expert in intelligence, counterterrorism, and foreign policy. He joined Ukrainian Foreign Legion in March 2022, just a few days after Russia's full-scale invasion and he's also a New York Times best-selling author. Welcome, Malcolm. Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Tell me, please, Malcolm, uh, what is the major difference in the war you experienced in Ukraine compared to what you experienced before of uh, being a U.S. Navy officer? Well, let me put it this way. Um, I come from a very specialized world. When people hear cryptology, the first thing they think is code breaking and everything, and that's true. I mean, I was a foreign language specialist. I was a, you know, the, we have this joke in the community. I was a black guy that spoke Arabic. So I was used in every capacity of US intelligence, uh, primarily signals intelligence, then, you know, other operations, human intelligence and things like that. But I started my career in Beirut, Lebanon in 1983, two days before the suicide bombing of the American embassy, actually, I arrived in Beirut. And within 24 hours, 69 people would be killed in a suicide bombing. All U.S. intelligence officers, all nine CIA officers were in the embassy for a meeting. They killed them and their staff, you know, up to 16 Americans died. And from that point on, I was like deeply embroiled in terrorism operations and counterterrorism operations. So the terrorists were throwing attacks at us. We were trying to collect enough intelligence to predict and head off those attacks. That was a very, very big part of my career. However, we also had to deal with, you know, Middle East warlords, uh, you know, carrying out conventional warfare. I mean, I took part or supported operations, including the airstrikes in Syria. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, bombing Libya, bombing Syria again, <laughs> you know, and pretty much fighting every war that we fought in the Middle East between 1983 and 2001. Uh, and, you know, that included going to Desert Storm, go invading Iraq, uh, you know, uh, going to Afghanistan at the beginning of that, and then retiring and becoming an intelligence contractor, which is a different job. You do the same job for a different organization for a load more money. Uh, but the missions were very different, only with the exception of Desert Storm. Um, Desert Storm was a full-scale war where we had a coalition of forces. You know, all, I was with the Arab forces. First, I was with the uh, Amphibious Task Force that was prepared to invade Kuwait. Then I went ashore, went on land with the Saudis, uh, but we had Saudis, Kuwaitis, Emiratis, Qataris, Jordanians, Syrians. We had, a, we had a division of Syrian troops. Egyptians, if you can imagine that. I think there was even a contingent from Lebanon. So this giant coalition of pan-Arab forces, plus the U.S. Army, plus the Marines, plus the British, invading to liberate Kuwait. That was a big war. It was a big war machine. Now... Let's step back and compare every other operation, including Iraq. I was working in and out of Iraq for over 10 years, uh, saw a lot of suicide bombings, a lot of suicide bombings. Um, same thing with Afghanistan. I was in Afghanistan when the initial invasion uh, happened. Uh, but here's the difference. America dominated those wars, dominated them 100%. They were on our terms. Terrorism can throw curveballs, but they were on our terms. Full, total air supremacy, not even dominance, supremacy. Anybody who had an Air Force who was stupid enough to come up against us would lose your Air Force. So these are asymmetric, as we would put it, to where the disproportionate amount of force would literally wipe anybody out of our way. And our opponents would fight us asymmetrically by not fielding big armies, right? The, the joke is, is that we lose to everybody who wears flip-flops. And to a certain extent, that's true. Set 
all of that aside, right, there is nothing the United States has done since the Vietnam War ended that is anything remotely close to Ukraine. I often describe where my field of battle in Ukraine, which was in Kharkiv province uh, during the counteroffensive and the, you know, the months leading up to it, was closer to the Ardennes forest of you know, Belgium and France in 1944. Only in winter, when we had fog and no air power. So it was men with rifles, tanks, and artillery. And that's all the resources you get, right? And drones are the equivalent of those little Piper Cub observation aircraft that could fly just, you know, a few hundred feet in the air and look for them. So we stepped back in history, but we're fighting the war that we really prepared for in the 1970s and 80s. And here's a little clue that's going to, that's going to be very interesting. We are now beating, when I say we, this is the Ukrainians. I was a legionnaire. I am still a legionnaire. I, my battalion commander wants me to come back right now, today. Um... We are fighting the Russians who have their most advanced equipment, whatever they think is their best, with equipment and technology from the 1970s. And that's the war we would have fought had we had a fight with the Soviet Union. It would have been a massacre, just as it's a massacre right now. It's just we could use bigger and better weapons. I need to express my uh, endless, endless respect to you and your friends who are fighting the war, not only for Ukraine, but for the whole free world. And what you're doing is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, it is uh, unbelievable that you have entered the fight, which uh, our governments and my government, Germany, is not ready to enter, but you have done it. Thank you for that. But the West was preparing for war in Europe for decades and all the dozens and hundreds of tanks, IVs were prepared for that. And in the plans, it was very easy, like two weeks, the US sends the equipment to the European theater and NATO wins the war. We read it in Tom Clancy books, in other books. What has, what has uh, gone here wrong? Well, you know, I often give a lot of polit you know, political and military analysis and a lot of people say, you know, you were really, you're just a senior enlisted person, right? Like the equivalent of a master sergeant. Well, we're the ones who do all the work. And we see from the first day you come in the military to 20 years, we have the technical expertise to comprehend the mechanics of warfare at a level a lot of strategists and senior officers often lose, right? I often do speeches together with Admiral Jim Stavridis, former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. And he's always surprised at, at what I know. And I go, I did that job, all right? I did the work. I worked at this level. So I'm going to give you that perspective, okay? What happened here is that we had an underestimation of two things. Uh, I came to Ukraine one month before the invasion as as doing independent analysis of the invasion routes into Ukraine, right? I rode every road that I could from, Su from Sumy to, to Kiev, all the way up, you know, from the, the, the Bulgaria, uh, Belarus border. You, could, you needed to feel the invasion route. And the first thing I noticed, I said, hey, there's going to be a lot of difficulty for the Russians. And my partner who was Ukrainian said, why? I said, do you know how many so cars the gas stations are between Sumy and, and Cherniv? There's like 40. And they are all liquor stores. Right? These guys are going to be drunk. They're going to move very slowly. And it literally is what happened. One of the first videos out of the invasion was them looting a so car or an Oko of first the, the cash register, then all the liquor off the walls. And for those uh, listeners who watch us, if you can imagine a typical Ukrainian gasoline station on a highway, 
It is a gasoline station where it is absolutely legal to sell alcohol. And they have an, uh, a corner with all types of whiskey, cognac, wine, of course, but also hard liqueurs like cognac, whiskey, vodka, gin, and other things. And they are mostly high quality. And uh, these are the goods which in Russian stores would be in a luxury section. And the Russians, we, we, we saw it in the first videos, they were absolutely shocked that the Ukrainians have that type of goods in a normal store. So the Russians were indeed shocked by the amount of alcohol, oh, and shocked. indeed they started loot. Right. <laughs> they were shocked right into their vehicles with liquor. <laughs> I mean, it took what could have, with a competent army, been accomplished in four or five days, because you have to move with 60-ton vehicles, stop, refuel, prepare to fight, fight. Uh, you know, um, so before the war, I analyzed all that. And once I saw the, the quality, I drove literally from Lviv to the, to the Russian border. I was like, there's no way they're going to get through this. They're going to drink their way to a stop. And every stop, Ukrainian special forces <laughs> or partisans or javelin teams are going to be waiting for them at every gas station. And you have some of the finest gas stations in, North, in Europe. And by the way, you, you, you undersold that. It is not a corner. <laughs> it is a wall <laughs> of liquor. I mean, a huge wall. I mentioned Sokar because they sell Azerbaijani cognac by the, by the ton. Jack Daniels actually in a little display case right next to uh, Jack and Coke. So the Russians were already defeated to a certain extent at the beginning of the war by their own proclivities. Um, but I came here to study that. And then... I actually sat on air on, you know, I was senior, I was intelligence analyst, counterterrorism analyst for NBC News, MSNBC. And they had academics coming on going, oh, Ukraine will fall in as many as three weeks and Kiev will fall in three days. And I would get on air in some place like Kamenets Podilsky, where at one place I reported and from, and I, I was like, whoa, 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 you guys have never been to Ukraine. <laughs> okay. The second thing that I thought was important was, in the pre-war, I went to Avdivka with General Sersky and General Pavlyuk, right? General Sersky is now commander of the Ukrainian army. General Pavlyuk at the time was commander of the Joint Force Area at along the Russian border, right? We were 70 meters from the Russians when we did our little show and they fired at us. But Pavlyuk and Sersky, when I met those two guys, first thing I said was, they cannot be beat. They cannot. They're two short little guys, right? Shorter than me. And I was like, these guys don't care where the Russians coming from. They're going to fight them and beat them. So I went on air with this one academic who was, you know, defense scholar. And he goes, there's no way Ukraine can resist here. I was like, whoa, I got some news for you, Slick. I go, I'm here in Ukraine. And I'm going to tell you one thing that none of you have talked about for the last three weeks. The Ukrainian army is in the field. And they have all of their Javelin missiles, all of their war stocks. I drove around that country in the last two weeks. I never saw a Ukrainian army vehicle move because they were already out waiting for the Russians. And that's what happened. The Russians walked into a buzzsaw. They walked into a slaughter that was prepared for them. And the competency of the Ukrainian army was underestimated by everyone except me. Because I saw those guys preparing. And I knew if they open up with those javelin missiles, this war is pretty much going to, it's going to come to a stalemate. But when we come back to uh, this development during the last two years. We are currently in the third war of the full-scale invasion, and the Russians have utterly failed with their prognosis that they will win this war within one day, three days, one month, one year. Uh, what do you notice fighting in International Legion against the Russians? How did the Russians change their tactics if they had? Okay. Very early on, Russian forces were on the assault, right? But as we learned in Hostomel and a couple of other places, Cherniev, uh, they really didn't know they were invading Ukraine. Many of them did not. The VDV knew, the Spetsnaz knew, most commanders would not even tell their majors and captains 
what they were doing. One group that was captured northeast of Cherniv said, we're on an exercise. Why are you shooting at us? You know, I mean, they didn't know. So when you have that depth of lack of knowledge where you think your massed armor weight is going to push you to victory, the Ukrainians are going to run away. Look, I was in Ukraine only one month and it was clear to me, Ukrainians cannot be subjugated, period. Okay, everyone on day one of the war was like, oh, now we fight. Now here's where we kick their asses, you know? And that spirit has never left anyone in the Ukrainian army since that day. I've said this many times. Ukraine has heart and they fight for that old saying, I can't recall who said it, where he said, they don't fight out of the hatred of the enemy in front of them. They fight for the love of the people who are behind them that they're defending. And that is what the International Legion is. That's why I joined day one. I went straight to Washington, D.C. I, I bought a whole portfolio of my military history. And they were like, you're a, you know, you're a super spy. You're, you know, you're, yeah, you're on. Go to Kiev. And in fact, I was invited to come uh, talk to one of the deputy minister of defenses and uh, was brought over to the, 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 what we call the secret legion, the Gur legion, uh, which was being assembled at that time for paramilitary warfare operations. And, you know, they quickly figured out, you know, you're, you're a very high profile person. You know, you've got millions of followers in social media. You are known to everybody in America. You've been on Bill Maher's show five times. Um, they said, would you do a special broadcast to the United States about how you quit and join the Legion. I was like, yes, absolutely. And I did that. You know, I went on air on MSNBC. Everybody had seen me a week earlier as an analyst. And then here I was in my Ukrainian army uniform with a rifle in an air raid, two in the morning, snow is falling, going, I joined the International Legion because Ukraine deserves our defense. And it still does. We have members from 52 nations. Uh, the Legion has lost almost 100 soldiers in the last two years. That's a lot. I mean, it's not as much as some other organizations, but it's a lot, which means, you know, we have three to one wounded. Um, one of my teams that I personally trained, we had 19 guys on their first mission by complete fluke. Every person was wounded. Six seriously, but most others were just like little shrapnel, but... They all had to be pulled off of the line because uh, Ukrainian medical really takes care of its troops, really does. So we have legionnaires uh, who have been fighting nonstop for two years, nonstop. Uh, Sergeant Major of the Legion, uh, who was, he's now with 3rd Battalion's uh, uh, Special Purpose Brigade uh, Battalion. Guy's been here nonstop for two years. He's marrying a Ukrainian now. So <laughs> we have dedication. What we need is an expanded recruitment because Ukraine really needs manpower. And I think the Legion, if Ukraine were to pull out all the stops and, you know, let me go out and recruit, <laughs> I would, they could have thousands of recruits from all over the world. Now, you know, uh, I think they need to expand the Legion, not view it as something as a, a cute thing. We will clearly come to this question a bit later, but before we do, don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. We are talking to Malcolm Nance, who is a U.S. Navy senior chief petty officer, retired, and who is fighting in the Ukrainian International Legion uh, since two years, a bit over two years already, fighting back the Russian aggression. Uh, Malcolm, uh, before we go to this question of uh, the size of... Quick comment. Uh, so you can correct it. I, f I was in the Legion for almost one year, and I spent the last year supporting the Legion and Ukraine in Washington. Sorry for my mistake, okay. indeed. But uh, you, are, you have been talked already uh, that uh, the, the, the tactics changed. The yeah. uh, first Russian troops who invaded Ukraine, they didn't expect the, um, the resistance. Uh, they were uh, destroyed uh, in, uh, in that first wave of attack. But now the Russians have adopted, uh, obviously. Uh, how do you see it in your daily fight? 
Let me tell you how and why the Russians adapted, because the news media really got this wrong, certainly last summer with the counteroffensive. Um, they, they say, oh, the Russians spent this spring and the few months before the counteroffensive preparing defenses. That's not what happened. Um, the first wave of the Russian war, Russia got utterly beat almost everywhere along the line, particularly in the north. Just destroyed. Three armies eliminated until they withdrew. So these are the guys who got surprised. Most of their professional soldiers died. Then came what we call the head on anvil strategies that the Ukrainians allowed the Russians to do. By June, you were seeing operations in Severodonetsk and Lysychansk. The Russians would send a mass of soldiers into a Ukrainian anvil. And the Ukrainians would prepare heavy defenses and allow them to hammer their head against these cities until they lost 10, 20,000 soldiers at a time. And then, as, as President Zelensky says, when you've completed that defense and we've lost 10,000 soldiers, we'll give you that village of 5,000 people and move back five, uh, two kilometers. And then you'll do it against Lysychansk. And then you'll lose 5,000 soldiers. And we'll give you that little dirt village or that small town. And as President Zelensky said, oh, we're going to get it back. Your soldiers are dead. This is what we call the head against anvil strategy. Russia would just bash its brains out. That happened in June, July. But by August, Ukraine had been preparing its own counteroffensive. And the Russians had pretty much dug in along the line and were still in the same posture that they were in in March, April, and May, right? Still thinking they could do these offensives. The Ukrainians had no combat capacity. And that's when the September counteroffensive occurred in Kharkiv province. Um, and that was, to me, that was amazing because, and it will be the last time it ever happens. <laughs> it, Ukraine caught the Russians off guard due to good reconnaissance, good, due to good strategic intelligence sharing with the United States. And what I thought was a very tough line shattered in a matter of hours. And in fact, I made a video as a joke because uh, we were the special purpose brigade. We were very far out with the joint terror, uh, the joint uh, special operations task force at the tip. But within three hours, the Russian line had fallen so fast. Artillery was coming up behind me. I was like, they're supposed to be 20 kilometers behind me. The Russians ran, ran everywhere. Uh, you know, you know, where we were, Ivanivka, uh, Izum, uh, and the Western approaches to Kupiansk. When they told us we were going to take Kupiansk in 72 hours, I was like, this is going to be a tough fight. We're all going to be shooting all day, all night. But the Russians shattered like broken glass because they didn't think Ukraine had the offensive capability. But some things, you know, you know, the Russians, they fell back almost all the way to the Russian border in many of those areas. Now, come November 2022, this is where Russia really put the posture that they're in right now. They spent all winter digging in tank traps, millions of landmines, and those lines were very tough. When I met Minister Reznikov earlier this in spring of 2023, First time you ever met a legionnaire. That's a little surprising, right? <laughs> you know, hundreds and hundreds of us. You know, I mean, he, he met me in a in a in a, dip, in a diplomatic briefing. I was with some VIPs, and he said, "This counteroffensive will not be what you had happened in 2022. It won't be easy. It's going to be tough. We're going to push all along the Russian line and see what breaks." Right. So the Russians changed their strategy to do defense in depth, and that worked. It worked for them, okay? But what else also worked was Mobniks, bringing out hundreds of thousands of disposable men. And then they started the same head against anvil strategy on Bahmut, <laughs> right? Head against anvil. Let's just lose thousands and thousands of guys. But it became so clear Russia had adopted this and they didn't care what the people were. They had fantasies in their head that if they take Bahmut, they could break through the Kramatorsk and they would be in Dnipro in hours. 
And everybody was like, are they crazy? No, they would just rather lose 10, 20,000 men. Same thing occurred this fall in Avdivka. Okay, Avdivka should have fallen in 2014. <laughs> I have nowhere. I was there. It was heavily fortified, but it really was 10 years past its due date. And for the Russians to now do head against Anvil again in Avdivka for one small town, they're just slaughtering their own forces and their own armor. So say what you will. Yes, Ukraine is suffering. Um, all of our forces are fighting. Men are being rotated through these combat zones and are taking losses. But Russia thinks they can sustain these deaths. And they can't if America gives Ukraine the resources we need at the levels we are asking for. Here's the level. Unlimited. Okay? If they were to have given us not 100 ATACMS missiles or 10 ATACMS missiles or whatever it was, 100. But the U.S. is about to destroy 1,000 ATACMS missiles. We're going to have to pay like a billion dollars to get rid of them. Just say, hey, all the inventory goes to Ukraine. Bye. Right? We're building brand new missiles that are even better than the ATACMS missile. But we saw on day one, rocket one, Ukraine destroy an entire Russian helicopter base. Right? With these missiles. Indeed. We remember, we remember that video, that night attack on an airfield yeah. of Russians. As the Russians filmed it by themselves, they're like one helicopter, two, three, five, ten helicopters <laughs> are burning uh, simultaneously. And then they go pick up these tungsten steel balls, right? You know, some 36,000 tungsten steel. It was a Claymore mine. It was a shotgun above that airbase. We could have been doing that every day, all day, if the U.S. had given us the resources. Indeed, and we are talking to Malcolm Nance, uh, who is a fighter in International Legion in Ukraine, and before he has been a U.S. Navy Chief uh, PT Officer and a best-selling New York Times author, a lot of capacities of this man. And he's fighting in Ukraine against the Russian invasion. Uh, don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. We are continuing with this stunning conversation. I enjoyed it very much. And you, you describe the reality of, the, of this war. And you already said that you need more men in International Legion and you need more arms. What exactly is your level of needs? Well, I think we're getting enough arms. I think we're getting enough weapons. Um, you know, Ukraine has been having a good flow of small arms, rifles, things like that. That's, that's not really what is needed. What's needed is expanded base of manpower. Um, it's not just the International Legion. The Ukrainian army allows foreign troops to now join any Ukrainian army battalion or brigade. Um, but in the Legion where, where, where I was, I tried to instill this organizational esprit de corps, right? Like it was based on the, the French Foreign Legion uh, the, 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 and the Spanish Foreign Legion. And I think Ukraine could actually turn that, that the Legion itself into a crack troop if they dedicated the time and, and resources. But we don't have time and we don't have resources. So everyone is on the line. Everyone is fighting. Um, but I think we could we could use a lot more manpower. The Legion now has four battalions, three infantry, uh, one special operations, and that could be expanded. But some other things should happen, and I've, I've emphasized this with the Legion myself. Legionnaires should be forced to learn Ukrainian. And I've, I've, I've got two guys right now, they speak fluent Russian, but in two years we have guys who only know how to, you know, Say, you know, say, you know, beer and and talk, right? <laughs> Piva and talk. No, that there there has to be a rotation and an education basis, which brings them when they come into Yavariv or whichever training facility or the polygon that they're going to, you have to say, hey, in like the French Foreign Legion, in eight weeks, you're gonna speak a thousand critical words in Ukrainian. Right. Like like attack or duck or hide uh, or shoot, you know, or I have Russians on the right flank. So these are things these are just technical things that could be used to help.
But I think so. Currently, currently, sorry for interrupting you. So currently, the legionnaires they can communicate between each other, but they cannot communicate to outside of the legion to a Ukrainian commander who maybe doesn't speak English. We actually have a chain of command. All officers in the legion are Ukrainians, and they are all English speakers. The official language of the legion is English, even though we have an enormous number of French, German, uh, Czech. Uh, troops, things like that, and Latin Americans. I, I, when I trained at uh, a new Legion uh, platoon at Yavoriv, a special operations platoon, I had to train in three languages, Spanish, French, and English, um, you know, and then try to integrate all of that. But we did. At the end of our training, everybody knew what they had. Our Ukrainian officer had to know English, uh, whereas if we had time, we would have been able to say, hey, you know, mandatory. And I, I, we still may affect that, right? We still may be able to do that uh, if we can get, you know, buy-in from land warfare to say, when you come off, you better learn 500 words. Uh, but right now, we speak to our Ukrainian officers. Our Ukrainian officers speak up to the brigade or cross battalions. Uh, you said you have like four battalions in the Legion, uh, one special operation, three normal infantry battalions. You don't have like any heavy equipment like artillery no. or aviation, of course. Uh, what are the uh, the typical operations, if you may uh, elaborate on that, which uh, the Legion is uh, being involved in? Well, the standard operation that the Legion has been involved in is infantry assault. Uh, that's absolutely certain. And even our special operations were direct action. Uh, same with the legion, the, the, the legionnaires who are in Gur, direct action. That is a typical assault. Uh, we assault, we defend. Uh, our heaviest weapons are 50 caliber machine guns mounted on Humvees and mortars. But the Ukrainian army has adequate artillery fire support for us. It's being able to integrate what where we are with what we see and be able to report back this must be killed and every battalion in the ukrainian army has a starvation of artillery so this is not a legion problem it's a it's a systemic ukrainian problem but let me tell you something when the ukrainians start shooting at things they hit it okay you, i mean you know i wish to god they had more multiple rocket launch systems more HEMARS more ATACMS missiles, more heavy throw weight. But in terms of regular artillery, cluster was the greatest. I'm sorry, giving us, giving Ukraine cluster a year and a half into the war was ridiculous. That should have been trucked out by the tens of thousands of, of shiploads. And it has now changed it. The Russians are terrified of cassette, as they call it, right? Of U.S. cluster. Because when it comes... You're, you're, it doesn't matter if you're hiding. You're going you're gonna to feel it. Uh, same thing with, uh, you know, these ATACM strikes or, you know, HEMAR strikes where you have large concentrations of soldiers. And it's finished. We, the Russians have nothing that's hitting us like that. They have lots of heavy steel, but they just don't have the ability to throw it. Uh, really heavy artillery. Now, this has changed NATO fundamentally, Right. Uh, the U.S. Army found that after the first year of the Ukrainian war that they were 10 times short of what they would need for a war with Russia or China. 10 times. Um, we actually only have two factories in the United States that produce these shells. Uh, but we need more high-tech shells, uh, more multiple rocket launch systems, and certainly more deep strike, like the Taurus missile. Could really use the Taurus missile. They, those missiles, uh, Scalp, Taurus, when they hit, they have strategic effect. Okay? I had been saying for a very long time to my, my, my fellow people in Ukraine who would listen, you got to try to get those Russian submarines and Russian ships that are launching the caliber cruise missiles. Well, best place to get them is when they're in dry dock, feeling safe, having coffee, which is what we did with the Scalp missile. Sank a submarine that wasn't in water. You know, destroy these ships using the drones. Just brilliant asymmetric advantage needs to be taken. But I have to tell you, I think that United States and NATO in some areas are holding out on Ukraine. Seriously, I think they're holding out on Ukraine on electronic warfare. I come from that world. 
Okay? If the United States sets its mind to jamming every drone in Russia, it can do it. So why are you not sharing that? And that should have been a national electronic warfare effort between the United States and Ukraine. Let's make Russian Mavic drones and, and uh, uh, FPV drones and Lancets nullify them or seize control of them. Who can learn more from this war, the Ukrainians from the NATO troops or the NATO troops from the Ukrainian experience on the ground? Right now. I've been around a lot of these wars, okay? Uh, Ukraine is without all question the single most experienced army in the world. And here's why. Because when this war is over, the threat is not over to Ukraine. Everyone's going to be a reservist. This war. Okay, Zelensky says he has half a million men in uniform. Uh, virtually everyone has stayed there for two years, men and women, men and women. This and these old hands, right? These gray beards like me, they're going to be training um, these young kids who were 18. And one thing I have to say about General uh, Sierski, a lot of people don't like him. He rotated literally every brigade into major combat in like Bahmut, Avdivka, to get that experience of, you know, if they didn't have it before, we sat in Kharkiv, we were like, yay, we broke glass and went up and took Kupiansk. That's nothing. That's not Bahmut, baby. Okay, that was not Andivka or Avdivka or any illicit chance. That was none of the hard places. Everyone got rotated to the hard spot so that they would know what real fighting was like. And we lost a bunch of really great guys, guys in my platoon. But everyone in Ukraine uh, has some measure of combat experience. And if you've never been bombarded for 72 hours nonstop, okay, then you haven't been in a war. <laughs> it's just that simple. You've been in a police action, a counterterrorism action, a counterinsurgency. This is full-scale wholesale you know, war fighting. And Ukraine is now the global dominant. Russia, by the way, they won't survive this war. Whoever gets out of this war will never look at Ukraine twice. You know, that the word they call us, you know, the K word, they will think there is just nothing but death over there for us. We're not going back. So they'll retire and leave and the Russian army will lose all of its base of knowledge. And it's already lost all its tanks. It's using Chinese golf carts now. Also, the new uh, types of uh, not weapons, but just commercial products, which both sides, Ukrainians and Russians, use like commercial drones or FPV drones, which have significantly changed the the dynamic of war, as far as I, as a civilian, can understand. Yeah, well, certainly drones have. This is the biggest drone war in history. People just don't understand that these FPV drones go out by the dozens every day. I've helped fund like hundreds of them myself. There's a big entrepreneur, American, you know, who's been operating with Ukraine, who's been supporting Ukraine for years. Good friend of President Zelensky. He has bought tens of thousands of drones. And Ukraine's own drone manufacturing base in Lviv and Kamenetsk and Ternopil, they're, they're, everything's being comp built there. You know, it took me in the first six, uh, the first months of the war, I think it took us five months to get a grenade dropping mechanism and a small packet of fins. But we didn't even have the EOD experience to take apart a 40 millimeter grenade. And it took, we actually had to go to Kiev to find the guy who was doing that? Everyone's doing that in every brigade, every battalion now. And Ukraine watches then what we call bomber squadrons, right? They have bomber squadrons. Russia doesn't have that. Russia's sort of ad hoc. They are bringing in, they've always had their, you know, the, um, their, their, their artillery reconnaissance drones and things like that. They're getting adaptive, but Ukraine is integrating it more. And now France, I believe, has sent 20,000? I, I don't know if that number's correct. But some commercial attack drone that they develop for their army, they're sending the Ukrainians some insane number of those. Um, this is, I, I spoke to a drone manufacturer in the United States, and he was like, well, we're going to do surveillance and, you know, 
like the predator in Ecuador. And I was like, you're in the wrong war. You're not even in the same world. You need to get to Lviv, bring $10 million, start a drone bomb manufacturing company that can carry, you know, 50 kilograms of explosives and drop them through cassettes and you will have a future. But no one's going to be paying you for that. So he was like, oh, I don't understand. That's right. You don't understand. Ukraine will dominate. I think Ukrainian companies at the end of this war will be selling drone kit warfare kits to every army in NATO, period. No question. What are your expectations for this year? What will be the campaign and the challenges? <clears throat> One thing that I, I heard that I think I gr agree with this year, I mean, I, I, I go to Washington, I'm going to Washington as soon as I leave Germany. Um, you know, I met with the National Security Council staff, gave them some great recommendations like, you know, stop sending us MREs and send us 100,000 pieces of night vision. Because the war sort of slows down at 7 p.m., 8 p.m., and everybody goes into their holes. They don't attack, right? The Ukrainian army needs to transition like a NATO army. NATO armies are night fighters. They fight at night, and they, they start 11 p.m. That's when NATO starts to fight. You know, if we could go through the daytime, great. But we pretty much like coming at night so we can kill you in the dark. So I think that um, for the coming year, um, I think that the Ukrainians might be more open with General Sierski, um to sitting down with NATO and actually developing a Ukrainian-based offensive strategy. When we hit Kupiansk, we had every tank in northern Ukraine assigned to us. One night I was there, I thought it was like D-Day. Just tanks started coming in at four in the afternoon and seven the next morning, they were still rolling nonstop all night. And we hit the Russians so hard with mass power. We also need to understand, and we, under, we, we comprehended last year that engineering, sappers, Right, going through, being able to breach assault lines, knowing the Russians just have to sit there and shoot at you. Okay, um, General uh, Zelushny uh, had a strategy last year that started in June about counter battery fire, neutralizing every Russian artillery battery. If we had 5,000 more uh, um, HIMARS missiles and 200 more launchers, we could own Russian artillery. Um, the United States has that many launchers waiting in to be repaired, or the, the National Guard, if I'm not mistaken, has like 350 launchers. They're used on weekends only. <laughs> weekends only, and they don't even shoot, right? They just sit there and get painted and cleaned and all that stuff. I think... A strategic effort. The incrementalism of Washington needs to end. I have said that to people on the National Security Council, look them right in the eye. And I was like, you need to stop this. Well, we're going to give you this one thing, and maybe that will help you. Um, why the United States is, you know, why President Biden hasn't embraced what I would call a 100 F-16 initiative. I would. I'd make a big announcement. He should have made that announcement last night at the State of the Union. All stops are out for America. The abject, total, absolute, utter defeat of Russia is now America's strategic priority. We're going to give you the hammer, Ukraine, start hammering. But he has people on his National Security Council staff who worry more about Russia. There's nothing, there's only one thing Russia hasn't done, and that's used the nuclear weapon. It's the only weapon they have not used in their arsenal. And the way they're getting beat, they're not going to. Because one, the radiation just goes back into Russia. We saw that at Chernobyl. But we have to stop thinking we can manage through sniper shots of little pieces of equipment like 24 F-16s here and 12, you know, HEMARS and this batch. Mm -mm -mm. Empty. The old reserve. Did you know we were giving 
um, Morocco 500 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles. The, the Bradley, if your viewers don't know, it's a murder machine. Okay, the Ukrainians, if you saw that one video of the Bradley going against the T-90, the most absolute brand new vehicle in its inventory, and the Bradley runs out and hoses it down and ducks back and the Russian tank starts burning and he comes out and he just hammers it and hammers it and hammers it. That was one Bradley, <laughs> you know? Uh, it's a murder machine. And why the United States didn't go to Morocco, who does not need it, doesn't need it. I've been to Morocco. I've, I've seen their army. And just say, hey, we're going to cancel that order. We'll get you something in the future. And say, all of these Bradleys onto ships right to Ukraine right now. Go through every, every armored Humvee that is going to be turned over to another army needed to have gone to Ukraine. Right? They didn't even use Lend-Lease. Uh, but that's because there are individuals who are more afraid of Donald Trump talking bad about them than saving Ukraine. So go figure. Absolutely. That is a very powerful statement. Give Ukraine everything Ukraine needs. Give Ukraine Bradleys. Give Ukraine Atacams. Give Ukraine F-16s. Give Ukraine every piece of ammunition. We were preparing for decades for the war in Europe. And now we have this war in Europe. And Russia is attacking. That is what we were expecting all the time. So do your job, defend Ukraine, send it, send this weapon to Ukraine and help Ukraine to defeat Russia to stop this threat. It was Malcolm Nance, who is a U.S. Navy senior chief PT officer, retired, specializing in naval cryptology, expert in intelligence, counterterrorism and foreign policy. New York Times bestselling author fighting in the International Legion of Ukraine, this war against Russia. Thank you, Malcolm, for your service. It is my pleasure. And I'm glad you, you brought me here because I like talking about helping Ukraine. And thank you so much for you having watched this. Don't forget to like, to share, to subscribe to this channel. Wait for the new uh, interviews. And once again, Malcolm Nance, thank you for your service, not only to Ukraine, but for Europe, for the US, for the whole world. Stay safe. All the best for your friends and comrades. And uh, bring us victory. Well, Slava Ukraini. Heroim Slava. Yeah.